Hi, I'm Tiffany Watt-Smith. I'm a historian of emotions. And today, I'm going to be thinking about enigmas and emotions. I'm going to be thinking about how difficult it can be to read someone else's emotion, but also how people can deliberately make themselves emotionally enigmatic uh, in order to uh, resist attempts to control them. Good evening, and welcome to the fifth Darwin College lecture in this series on enigmas. Tonight, we turn to emotion. So emotion, certainly an enigma. How do you reduce it to measurable parameters? How do you analyze it, understand it? Emotional intelligence. We Earth scientists are used to being told we have the emotional intelligence of a stone. I could you quote Jane Austen's Elizabeth Bennet? What are men to rocks and mountains? <laughs> but then I'm a marine geophysicist, and in Persuasion, Mrs. Croft says, we none of us ex expect to be in smooth water all our days. Now, some people do understand emotions. Think of the 1950s cigarette advertisers, today's gambling ads. That's the demagogue's evil skill. People elected Mussolini and Hitler. But then think of uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. They had that astonishing gift of using emotion to guide us to live better, become better. If you're old enough, uh, some of you may remember the birds with a Y. Turn, turn, turn to everything there is a season. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. Those ancient words are not from the 50s or the 60s. They're from Ecclesiastes, attributed to King Solomon. But they're still true. And emotions can come suddenly or slowly. They can last a lifetime or vanish with the breeze. But as humans, we have a fierce need to understand emotions. And is, but is han trying to harness the power of emotion a good thing? Will it just enable advertisers to drive us to consume and consume, or empower a dictator? Is, it hard, is emotion hardwired into us? Are we doomed to be directed machines? Do we have a tiny scrap of free will left? miserable thoughts. But this is Valentine's Day, so please welcome <laughs> Dr. Tiffany Watts-Smith from Queen Mary, University of London, to talk about the enigma of emotion. Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out on this, um, on this lovely Valentine's Day. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to Cambridge. It's, um, it's actually it's a real honour to be here. I did my undergraduate here and then I came to do my um, MPhil some years later. Um, and it's been lovely to come back today. It's also been a very good opportunity to return some rather overdue library books. So that's also <laughs> been good. Um, um, I would uh, like, if you don't mind indulging me, to begin with a, a small game. Um, uh, I'd just like to ask you, you know, no, don't worry, you know, no one's got to say anything or anything like that, um, or do anything particularly that makes them exposed. I'm just going to ask you to choose someone uh, that you can see in your sight line, or it could be me if you like, um, anyone really, uh, you don't need to tell them. And I just want to see if you, I uh, just want you to spend a bit of time seeing if you can work out what they're feeling right now. Um, and just silently, so maybe you're looking at their facial expressions, maybe their posture, uh, maybe the way they're moving around in their seats, maybe something you can hear in their breathing. Um, okay, I'm just going to give you a minute to do that, okay? Okay, minutes up. How did it go? It's hard, isn't it? What sort of things were you looking at, if you don't mind 
shouting out? Eyes. Eyes. Interesting. Embarrassment. <laughs> yes, I imagine there was quite a lot of embarrassment around at that particular moment. Body language. Body language. That's interesting. Yeah, what they were looking at. What's that? What they were looking, what they were looking at. Yeah, so a sort of narrative, a kind of context for, for the emotion. Great. Um, well, a few weeks ago when I started thinking about this talk and what I would say, thinking about enigmas on the one hand and emotions on the other. Um, the first thing I kept thinking about was that experience that you've just had, that, that, that moment of trying to detect what someone else is feeling from some outward observable sign, um, trying to work out the sort of mysterious or enigmatic inner life of their feelings. And then the next thing that I thought about, and it sort of came, a sort of parade of people came sort of nonchalantly uh, through my mind, are those people who are kind of very deliberately enigmatic in their emotions. I was thinking about people like James Bond, or the Mona Lisa, or the Fonz, or Tilda Swinton in almost anything that she's in, um, <laughs> or poker players, therapists, uh, teenagers, um, people who seem to make it intentionally hard for you to read how they're feeling, and seem to take some glee in that too. Um, we live, as we've just heard, uh, in a world which seems increasingly to expect us to make ourselves emotionally legible to each other, and, and prizes the capacity um, to understand how other people are feeling. And this demand, it seems to me, though useful, also falls rather heavily on, or it feels more risky for some people rather than others. So I began to wonder what happens, really, when we remind ourselves um, how difficult it is to read other people's emotions, and even how difficult it is to read our own emotions, um, and more crucially, under what circumstances might deliberately hiding your emotions be quite a useful strategy of defiance or perhaps even self-protection. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, I would like to begin, since we are here um, at the Darwin College Lectures, with an anecdote uh, that Charles Darwin recounted in his 1872 book, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. And this is an extraordinary book if you've not come across it before. It was written at the height of his fame. Uh, it became a public sensation. It was a bestseller. And, and it really is a testament, I think, to the feverish interest that middle-class Victorians had in trying to understand their emotions. So we think we live in an age of emotion and somehow that that is kind of unique and new thing to us now. But, um, but the Victorians, I'm afraid, really very much got there first. Um, Darwin's notebooks, uh, which, as I'm sure you know, are held in the library here, um, reveal that he became interested in emotions as early as the 1830s. Um, during his voyage on the Beagle, he noted down the emotions he witnessed in animals and people. When his first child was born in 1839, he immediately began a journal noting the various expressions which he exhibited. Now, at that time, the dominant explanation for what were known really as passions rather than emotions um, were, were, were theological explanations. Uh, the belief that blushes, perhaps, or flinches were, were really um, reflexes that were implanted by God, um, perhaps to sort of uh, show people when you had done something bad, you know, sort of uh, a, a kind of tell, if you like. Uh, Darwin's proposition was quite different, was that emotions themselves must have had, he wrote, a gradual and natural origin, that they must have evolved to protect us from harm, such as disgust or fear, or perhaps that they have evolved to help us bond, like love or compassion. So in 1867, he began work on emotion in earnest, and I'm about to get to this anecdote that I've promised you. Um, his, his archives reveal that he corresponded with missionaries and explorers around the globe. He asked them to describe the emotional characteristics of the indigenous people that they met. He himself became a collector of emotions closer to home. He went to photographers, shops and galleries in London and bought up postcards of these kind of forlorn-looking children and very histrionic, declamatory actors. Um, he studied his own facial expressions in the mirror. So this is a very different sort of Darwin, perhaps, to the one you're familiar with. Uh, he's a smiling and grimacing at himself in the mirror and trying to work out what emotions his face is showing. Um, he spent a lot of time observing his pets, 
Um, his dog, particularly, who is rather prone to disappointment, my favourite expression, when he discovers the dog that discovers that he's not going for a walk. The head drooped, the tail was by no means wagged. <laughs> and, uh, and just as you were doing a moment ago, he stole glances at strangers, at dinner parties, in the street. He noticed the way that emotions flitted across their faces. And finally, we get to this anecdote that I've promised. Um, so on a train journey, Darwin finds himself in a carriage sitting opposite a woman. And he notices that her depressus anguli auris, so these are muscles around her eye, became very slightly yet decidedly contracted. And this is a muscular contraction that Darwin knows usually precedes tears. And the expression causes Darwin to, to, to write this. He imagines some painful recollection, perhaps that of a long-lost child, was passing through her mind. So much, for me, is encapsulated in that perhaps of Darwin, perhaps that of a long-lost child. In fact, Darwin confesses in the opening pages of the expression that, I quote, the study of emotions is difficult, <laughs> no doubt, as you've just experienced. The physiological differences are slight and fleeting, and moreover, he writes, it's just too easy to imagine that you see the emotion of someone else when really it's just your own mood infecting the claim to objectivity. So in a way, the expression of the emotions is a book as much about the problem of observing emotions as it is about the emotions themselves. It's a book that plunges us fairly vertiginously into the question philosophers call the problem of other minds. It recognizes the relationship between outward feelings and, and those uh, outward um, symptoms and those mysterious subjective inner feelings is not always a stable relationship. And that when we do try to read another's feelings, we can easily get it wrong. Now, it's nearly 150 years since Darwin published The Expression of the Emotions. And today we live in an age where the idea that we should try and recognize and name our own emotions and learn to recognize, as best we can, the emotional states of other people is taken to be a public good. The school curriculum teaches children to label emotional states. People seeking psychological support are presented with sheets with different words to try and improve their emotional fluency. Emotional intelligence is a skill that's taught in business seminars. Much of this enthusiasm can be traced to Daniel Goldman's 1995 book of the name Emotional Intelligence, which synthesized and popularized research that had been conducted in the previous two decades and suggested that emotional intelligence, which, which he presented as a learnable social skill, could be correlated with a number of positive outcomes, from making friends to mental resilience to success in business. I mean, I have no reason to particularly doubt that, that correlation, and, of course, we are a long way from becoming emotionally literate uh, as a nation, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, but perhaps there is a sort of unintended consequence of this work. And because we are putting such a premium on the role of emotion in how it shapes our own and other people's decisions and behavior, while simultaneously we have to confront the very real daily reality that actually recognizing other people's emotions is quite difficult, then we find ourselves open, I think, to the allure and the promise of the emotion-detecting technology, this technology which promises to replace the fallible human mind, the mind that Darwin, with his confession that observing emotions is difficult, that, that perhaps... So we, we, we're trying to replace that Darwin mind with uh, an objective mechanical gaze. I'm actually reminded here um, of an episode of the American sitcom The Big Bang Theory, if anyone's seen it. This uh, is a sitcom that, fit, from your lack of laughter, I'm thinking maybe no, no one's seen it. Um, it's quite funny. Uh, it features this, a group of socially inept friends um, who are scientists at Caltech, and, and, and as has already been brought up, you know, there are issues surrounding emotional, intelli surrounding emotional intelligence there. Sheldon is a brilliant theoretical physicist, but he has difficulties recognizing what other people are feeling. And his friends discover that a team at MIT are developing a device that picks up subtle changes in heart rate and breathing, uh, which allows them to read human emotions. And the friends suggest that Sheldon gets a prototype, hoping that it will make him more empathic and, a, and generally a better friend. Oh, yes, he says. He's totally thrilled by this idea. Not only will I be able to read other people's emotions, I will be able to bend them to my will. LAUGHTER 
Last year, The Guardian reported that emotion detection machines, which alleged to be able to identify anger, fear, disgust, and sadness and, others, and other emotions in faces in a crowd, has grown into a $20 billion industry. These technologies are based on an assumption that the internal terrain of feeling can be detected by facial expressions, primarily muscular contractions around the eyes and the mouth. And this idea that these facial expressions kind of directly correlate to, to inner sensations and states of emotion is based on, I'd say, outdated research that suggests that there are a handful, usually about six, basic emotional expressions which are common to all people across the globe. And, and, and if you have this sort of sense of being able to reduce down the emotions into this basic universal state, then the idea is therefore that they can be read by a computer. Um, the person who's very, been very influential in developing this field is a, a psychologist called Paul Ekman, who you might have heard about. Um, he also claims to be able to read micro expressions. So these are like a tell, you know, your tells in poker, uh, people giving away emotions even when they are trying to hide how they're feeling. Um, now, many researchers since Ekman have taken issue with his conclusions, and they've argued that the kinds of um, photographs of facial expressions that he used in his experiments, in fact, do not accurately represent all ethnicities. And particularly, um, researchers have found serious inaccuracies when it comes to people of East Asian heritage. So these, these photographs that purport to represent basic emotional facial states are already look like they are racist. In a 2003 attempt made by the US Transport Security Administration to use emotion detection technologies based on Ekman's research to detect potential terrorists, um, this technology was shown not only to have been a failure, but also to have re-rehearsed racial profiling. So nonetheless, the emotion detection business is booming, spirited along by a belief that with enough data, the algorithms will be able to crack the enigma of the emotions. As um, Rana Al-Kalaubi, I think I've got her name wrong, actually, um, Kalubi, the CEO of Affectiva, which is one of the leaders in this field, believes... She thinks, sorry, she thinks this technology, um, quote, will tap into our visceral, subconscious moment-by-moment -moment responses. She wants to use facial... Uh, she uses facial recognition software and a global repository of data gleaned from people watching TV, playing computer games, and driving to train algorithms to analyze the emotional content of faces in a crowd. Um, perhaps this makes you a little nervous. I think it should do. Um, not just because of the big brother implications or the risk of this technology falling into the hands of those who seek political power, or because we already know that anything invo involving facial recognition software can lead to serious failures, failures of social justice, for instance, if it's used by police or psychiatrists or in the law courts. But I think the idea of emotional detection is also problematic because it's based on a very sort of oversimplified notion of what an emotion really is. Um, the professor uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett at uh, Northeastern University is amongst a growing number of neuroscientists that have argued that the idea that emotions can be detected from facial expressions or even from any physiological marker is a huge, um, mis is a huge mistake. It's a huge oversimplification. The brain, she writes, is immensely flexible, wiring itself to whatever environment it develops in. She writes of a dynamic relationship between language, culture, and brain chemistry, and describes the emotions emerging in highly complex ways, certainly involving automatic cognitive processes, but also involving interactive, socially situated, and embodied experiences. The picture she paints about what an emotion is is um, suggestive of, I think, continually mutating forms of plasticity rather than discrete and fixed physical signs, and a level of a level of complexity that I think would be impossible for any machine or, or any human to grasp. Through her writings, emotion emerges not so much as codes that can be cracked, but are more reminiscent of um, the tangled bank metaphor that Darwin ends the origin of species with. He, 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 he creates this picture of an incredibly complex area with millions of diverse 
pulsating interdependent life forms and processes, all of them forever continually in a process of change. So if we think about emotions like that, then they start to seem a little bit more enigmatic, perhaps, than the, the emotion detection technology would have us believe. So in a moment, I'm going to think a little bit more about how being emotionally enigmatic might be a form of resistance or disruption in a world which insists on knowing about and training and normalizing your feelings. And I want to ask what the consequences might be for that and for whom in those moments when we refuse to comply with this demand to make our emotions legible. Tell me how much you love me, famously instructs King Lear, but Cordelia, precipitating her banishment and the tragedy, refuses. I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. But before we get to those deliberately enigmatic, refusenik figures, um, I want to uh, circle back again to the question of what is an emotion. Because if emotions aren't simple reflex physical responses to external stimuli which are encoded in our brains at birth, then what are they? Now, people um, have been trying to understand their unruly passions in order to try and control them for a very long time, at least since the Stoic philosophers of the ancient world wrote their treatises on anger and love. As I've already mentioned, uh, I think Darwin's book, The Expression of the Emotions, um, arrived and helped precipitate in a moment of, uh, of intense interest in studying the emotions through a new scientific lens, one which privileged objective, observable physiological signs, raised heart beats, beats uh, dilated pupils, um, that privileged these signs over the kind of strange, shadowy theological explanations. In fact, even the word emotion was very, relatively new at this point. Um, it, it appeared in, in the English language at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, it was introduced by the philosopher Thomas Brown, who used, um, who used this word emotion to, to, to replace the much older language of the passions and the affections of the soul. And, and he wanted this new word, emotion, to demarcate this very secular explanation of the life of the mind. So following from Darwin, a whole generation of experimental physiologists and neurologists began to study emotions, and they used the technologies of photography and film. They used machines for measuring reaction times. Um, one of my favorite experiments uh, is by an Italian called Angelo Mosso, who tried to embarrass a rabbit by looking at it, and then, um, <laughs> and then tried to measure his embarrassment as a sort of rabbity blush, um, is, is what he called it. <laughs> So there was lots of this going on. Um, by the beginning of the 20th century, this work was being popularized by, by psychologists, and, and, and a kind of new account of the inner life became, you know, became, became well, this new account became well known. Uh, but this physiological turn to emotions, the emotions, uh, they did not, um, uh, that, that w w was not without its critics. Um, among them were those who feared that this new knowledge would be used to control unruly populations. In Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which is written in 1932, citizens must have monthly VPS, or Violent Passion Surrogate, treatments. They work like this. We flood the whole system with adrenaline. This is a kind of adrenaline-like substance. Um, so we flood the whole system with adrenaline, says the controller, to create the tonic of violence without any of the inconveniences. But I like the inconveniences, says the, says the savage. Well, we don't, says the controller. We like to do things comfortably. But concerns about this physiological turn, um, concerns about the new category, emotion, also came from um, less expected quarters, from historians and from philosophers, and also from anthropologists, who were beginning to doubt that emotional experiences actually were shaped by physiology alone. In a, field, uh, in a field defining essay published in 1938, the historian Lefebvre argued that the application of contemporary psychological frameworks, even the application of the word emotion itself onto the, onto the people of the past, was uh, a pretty insidious uh, anachronism. He suggested that emotions, even the basic ones, the so-called basic ones like disgust or, or anger, might have looked and even might have felt very different in the past. 
in the past. He wrote, there is an abyss between the morals and sentiments of the men of our age and theirs. If I'm honest, um, historians took quite a while to respond to this essay. <laughs> um, nothing goes fast in, in history. Um, but uh, by the 1960s, anthropologists had in fact taken up the challenge, and they were repeatedly drawing attention to the diverse emotional languages found around the world. They were, they were drawing attention to what he had called um, this abyss between different people's emotions. They drew attention to a range of concepts describing unfamiliar emotional states, like a wumbuk in Papua New Guinea, which is a kind of inertia that descends on a house when a house guest departs. So we, we might feel relief, but, uh, but there they feel, they feel a wumbuk. Or amai, am, am which is a Japanese word um, for the pleasure of sinking into the care of others, a word which many Japanese psychologists drew attention to because it didn't seem that there was a, a translatable parallel in the English language. It seemed that perhaps English speakers were anxious about this sort of feeling of over-reliance on another person, whereas in Japanese culture, that same emotion was seen to be quite valuable and highly prized. Or, or ligate, a word which was used in the jungles of the Philippines to describe a very particular combination of anger and grief and it was such a powerful form of anger that it could even propel someone to go off on a headhunting spree. So such studies suggested that these emotional languages might shape entirely different worlds of experience, not least because the values attached, attached to these emotions were not uniform. For instance, amongst the cooperative culture of the Pacific Islands of Afaluk, there is an emotion known as song, and this emotion is taken very seriously indeed. It describes the indignation that you might feel when you discover that you've got less than your fair share. Um, it's probably an emotion that most of us are familiar with, right? Um, the anthropologist who wrote about this emotion remarked that in many Western cultures, this same emotion might be felt, but it also might be felt to be a little childish, um, rather envious, perhaps petty, so we might not really express it or talk about it. And so it might get qu sort of quickly shut down. Whereas in Ifalak culture, which prides itself on fairness and, and, and exists because of a very sophisticated level of cooperation between its members, song, this emotion song, is celebrated, and anyone who expresses that they're feeling it is immediately sort of attended to by a flurry of people trying to put the, the, the injustice right. So buoyed by this work by anthropologists, historians finally got to work and began to unearth the, the forgotten emotional cultures of the past. And as had the anthropologists, they reckon, recognized that so much of what we feel is shaped by the cultures that we live in. The fashions and the moral judgments of, that surround us, the religious rituals, even what we think an emotion is, whether we think it's an emotion or whether we think it's a passion, um, even what we think an emotion is can bring feelings to life and make them disappear again. Uh, historians uh, started to unearth certain emotional categories which seem to have disappeared from the language, such as acedia, um, which was a kind, of, um, a kind of melancholy that was experienced by monks who lived in the Sinai Desert around the second and third century. And um, it, they kind of fell, it only happened around lunchtime, and they kind of fell into a sort of torpor, and it could be quite, it could be very serious, and they'd end up quarreling with their other monks, or sometimes it was so serious that they'd end up absconding, and then they might die in the desert. So it's a very sort of serious problem, and they believed it was kind of caused by these um, demons that would sort of whiz around the monastic community and then kind of infect people with acedia. Well, anyway, we don't have acedia anymore, obviously, but, um, but this, um, and it doesn't sort of straightforwardly map onto a kind of contemporary concept like depression. Um, uh, but at that time, it was, it was very significant. In fact, it was, um, it was one of the eight evil thoughts, and the eight evil thoughts precipitated the, um, uh, preceded the, um, the seven deadly sins. So acedia was the one that got lost. Um, uh, so, some, so they uncovered emotions which seemed to have disappeared gradually over time, and then other ones which suddenly popped into existence, such as the category of boredom. So no one spoke about feeling boredom, 
until about 1853, I think, um, it was when, <laughs> when Dickens first <laughs> mentions it. Um, obviously, people felt bored before, but they didn't really feel bored. They felt irked or wearied uh, by tedious things that were happening around us, like a terrible dinner party that you had to go to or something like that. But boredom became, a, uh, became demarcated as a very specific category by the Victorians. It appeared, it started to appear in medical literature. Um, politicians started worrying about boredom and, and the dangers that it, it might create in terms of idleness. Um, novelists start talking about boredom, particularly uh, feminist writers who are concerned about bo women and boredom, upper class women who are sort of, um, George Eliot writes about boredom quite a lot and the risks of that. Um, so boredom becomes demarcated as an emotional category and a thing um, about which uh, to worry. And I think we sort of still, we, we sort of are inheritors of that particular worry. So historians started to look at these particular shifts. And they also looked at sort of peculiar, unexpected responses. For example, that in the 11th century, knights, uh, brave men, could um, faint out of dismay and yawn, uh, and troubadours could yawn out of love. Oh, it's Valentine's Day, yes. <laughs> Great. I love that, yawning out of love. They yawned out of love because, I don't want to go over time, but they yawned out of love because, um, because there was a lot of waiting around in the troubadour literature. You know, there was a lot of hanging around for your beloved. <laughs> and, that, and, and also, lovesickness was an emotion which, um, which left people um, unable to sleep at night. So they were hanging around and they were tired. So they were yawning. <laughs> they were yawning for love. I think that's beautiful. Uh, anyway, um, and, uh, and they also found emotions which had radically changed um, their meanings. So, for example, um, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, there were, there were epidemics of nostalgia. Nostalgia was a fatal form of homesickness um, uh, which spread across Europe. In fact, it was considered so contagious and so dangerous a disease that, um, that Swiss soldiers who fought away from home were forbidden to sing the folk songs of their country in case it should trigger an attack of nostalgia. The last person to die of nostalgia, so the last time nostalgia appears on a death certificate, is 1918. It's quite astonishing, really. Anyway, but by the, by the early 20th century, people don't really die of nostalgia anymore. And of course, the word has changed its meaning. Now a pining for the past rather than a longing for home. So these kind of unusual and interesting historical and anthropological insights gave rise to a systematic study of emotions with talk of emotional communities all governed by shared emotional values and rituals, with talk of emotionologies which are prescriptive rules which often appear in advice, literature, medical or legal texts which instructed people how to feel. And the assumption that historians made and often still do make well, that more or less people's private experiences are being shaped by these emotional rules, these emotionologies. And I, and I guess to a certain extent, I think they were probably right. But I think it is... Um, Actually, I'm just going to give you another quick example, but I, I'll do it fast. I just don't want to run out of time. Um, I'm currently doing some work on female friendship. Um, and I'm quite interested in uh, early 20th century boarding school novels in which girls go to boarding school. Some of you might remember Angela Brazel. I've only just discovered her, but I think she's fab. Um, so if you look at the works of early 20th century authors like Angela Brazel, you'll find that fr the friendships that are depicted between girls are very romantic. The girls almost sort of swoon when they first set eyes on the person who will become their friend. And, and they hold hands, and they declare their love for one another, and they cuddle, and they kiss. And in some of this boarding school girls' literature, they, you know, they actually get into bed together. Now, this is a very different model of friendship than, than the model that I grew up with, oh, sorry, uh, um, captured 40 or 50 years ago, um, say, in Enid Blyton's Mallory Towers, if anyone remembers those books, um, where the friendships between the girls are much less romantic. No one talks about loving one another, and if a girl sort of links arms with another girl, it's usually because they're plotting some dastardly trick to play on the French mistress. Um, now, of course, this is fiction, um, but when we look at the real girls' boarding schools at this time, it is possible to actually see sort of changes in rules. So in one English girls' boarding school in the 1930s, the headmistress expressly forbade the girls from holding hands, and kissing was only allowed on birthdays. <laughs> Now, there may be several reasons for this change, this sort of new emotional rules. 
Perhaps it emerged from new anxieties um, surrounding the science of sexology with its demarcation of a new category of what they called sexual deviance, which was lesbianism. Perhaps it was partly due to fears circulating at that time about the ease with which people would be influenced by one another. So there was a general belief that the war had been caused uh, by a mob mentality, and there was a lot of anxiety at this time about how, easily it, how easy it was to be sort of affected by one another. And so we can see, I think, here's an example where we can see the interaction of medicine and politics and education um, shaping the emotional norms and the experiences of a whole generation. So I think it is important to recognize the way emotions are shaped not just by our bodies, but by the changing cultures we live in. Because it reminds us that emotions, um, to get back to our theme, are not uh, fixed and static things, but are subject to continual change. And keeping uh, a sense of this change in, in front of our eyes, I think, is very important when it comes to those moments that we feel, when we feel oppressed by the dominant values associated with some emotion in our own time. Um, briefly, today, we, we, we put a lot of store by happiness. Um, part of that can be traced, I think, to, to early 20th century industrial psychologists, uh, and their views were popularized in self-help literature, particularly in Dale Carnegie's How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, which was published in 1948. And he says that salespeople, business people, should always be vivacious. They should always be smiling. And if you happen not to be feeling cheerful, says Carnegie, think and act cheerful, and then you will be cheerful. So that cheerfulness might be linked to success is something that those of us who are congenitally grumpy uh, have to kind of learn to live with today. But take heart. In 1539, uh, an English lawyer and writer, Thomas Eliot, published a self-help book called The Castle of Health in which he advised readers to practice feeling sad. He offered lengthy descriptions of the causes of potential sadness. Imagine your ungrateful children, he exhorted his children. Imagine losing all of your money. Imagine your parents dying. It doesn't seem like a very promising technique for a self-help book, does it? Um, but according to Eliot, it was very useful to practice um, and gain familiarity with sadness so that when something truly awful did happen to you, as invariably it would, you were more um, familiar with that emotion and more able to tolerate it. And in fact, it wasn't simply that um, learning about sadness would make you better at sadness, but also that sadness itself was a rather desirable state at the time. There was even a cult, famously, of melancholic genius amongst intellectuals and artists. Um, being sad um, was caused by an excess of... Um, uh, um, one of the humours that, if you know a, a bit about Renaissance medical theories, the body was, uh, had four humours in it, and, and this humour was called black bile, and it was a kind of very thick, heavy, viscous sort of substance. And if you had too much black bile in your body, it would sort of literally weigh you down, you know, it would make you stoop and, and make you slow. And these qualities actually were considered to be very valuable. I mean, they would make a person more sober, more reliable, more truthful, more, more steadfast. Sadness, in fact, made you a better boss, a better spouse, a better parent, all of the things that we associate with happiness today. So historians of emotion can recognize that certain emotional communities or display rules, even if those have changed, um, can characterize groups of people at particular times. And perhaps then, recognizing these, recognizing these emotional communities and these display rules might help us solve the enigma of emotion. Could it simply be a question of putting our physiological knowledge together with our understanding of anthropologi anthropological and historical cultures so that we can understand the rules of an emotional community to which a person belongs? Well, perhaps... But, um, but nothing is ever really that simple, is it? Um, in her memoir, Fierce Attachments, the writer Vivian Gornick um, comes up with this really memorable image, I think. She, she, she writes about almost inhaling the culture of the women that she grew up with. She says, I absorbed them as I would chloroform on a cloth laid against my face. But sometimes the cultures that we live in don't work so powerfully or so completely on us. After all, you might know the emotional rules, but that doesn't mean you're going to follow them. You are human, after all. 
We all sometimes feel against the grain. Perhaps you get the giggles at a funeral. Perhaps you feel embarrassed by the lavish and expensive dinner that everyone else seems to be enjoying. Perhaps like Sarah Ahmed's feminist killjoy, you might greet your own wedding day, not with uncomplicated joy like you're supposed to, um, but with a sort of level of confusion and awkwardness around the whole thing. Perhaps you're not frightened of the dentist. Perhaps when you get an award, you don't feel proud, but you just feel fraudulent and exposed. Perhaps you feel panicked by the new baby rather than overwhelmed with love. Perhaps you might, as the guitarist Wilco Johnson said um, when he was diagnosed with cancer, with terminal cancer, um, that he felt euphoric at, at his approaching death. So we might inhabit the world, but that doesn't mean its rules always entirely inhabit us. Sometimes, of course, we have to disobey them to survive. So I've come to think that trying to categorize and read emotions is a bit like John Ruskin's attempt to master the language of the sky. Um, I don't know if you know this, but every morning for a while, he, he, he got up early and tried very rapidly to sketch the clouds. He had to work really fast, of course, because the clouds move. <laughs> um, and he, once he'd made these sketches, he tried to arrange them into a taxonomy. And um, he found this process almost impossible, trying to fix and arrange these drawings of the clouds. He said rather woefully, that the categories he placed his drawings of clouds in, in the end, became more a matter of convenience than true description. When I think about emotions, our own and other people, um, I think about the physiological reflexes and responses and, and, and the cultural rules. But I also realize that neither of these entirely dictate how or why we feel the way we do. Shaping emotions is also a vast and shifting network of individual experiences and histories, of personal tastes and desires, of those emotional communities which are not just public, but private, belonging to families, couples, friendship groups. This is a vast complex. It would be meaningless, I think, to try and attempt to reduce it to universal principles. And what is more, and now I'm going to move on to the, the final part of my paper, what is more, um, Within this sort of strangeness and illegibility, um, there is a great potential for hiding and evading and defying the emotional expectations of the world we live in. Um, okay. If you can, um, uh, bring to mind the, the Mona Lisa and her famously inscrutable smile. How many words have been dedicated to this smile? Um, is it the result of sexual allure, of bad dentistry, of a ghastly secret? We seem invested in her as an enigma. By being in her powerful gaze, she retains a sort of status uh, by not giving away her feelings. She has this kind of enigmatic allure. And Leonardo, of course, knew this. By depicting some feeling, by not making it easily readable, he makes us lean in and we are entranced. Um, in a world of emotional declarations, of transparency, of emotional intelligence and legibility, the prospect of emotional enigmaticness, if that is such a word, is I think rather intriguing, and not only just because of the sort of cool aloofness of, of the James Bond figure. Um, of course, withholding a display of emotion is an important part of many professions, police officers, doctors, judges among them, who need to create the appearance of emotionless objectivity. And of course, there are therapists and other in the psychological caring professions whose blank screen exists not only to make space for the, for the emotions of the person that they're listening to, but also to invite the patient's fears and projections and, and then hold them up for inspection. Many artists know that there is a freedom that comes with the emotionally enigmatic, the freedom to impose your own narrative on someone else, just as Darwin did with the woman who was about to cry in the train. I'm thinking about the ending of the 1933 film Queen Christiana um, with Greta Garbo. The camera, uh, this is the final scene, the camera pans up really close on her face and she has this kind of impassive, unreadable look to her. The director apparently instructed her to think of nothing to create this shot. And the reason for that was, he said, he wanted her face to be a blank piece of paper 
He wanted everyone in the audience to write the ending of the film themselves. So we have this beautiful freedom when we're confronted with emotional inscrutability, but it can also back people into a corner, can't it? When someone won't declare their feelings, it can also create feelings of awkwardness and confusion and bafflement and even rage. Um, there can be a sort of discomfort that leads to a kind of panic-stricken vomiting up of feelings. Think, for example, of the hard-boiled detective in the 30s noir film whose sort of impassive face leads the guilt-stricken culprit, <laughs> culprit to sort of eventually break down and confess they just can't take it anymore. Um, so I want to think about this kind of emotionally, uh, emotional ambivalence. Um, I want to think on the one hand about people whose emotions, moments when emotions can seem so confusing that they can't be read and how that kind of creates moments of defiance. And then I want to think finally about people um, who seem to present a kind of blank, emotion-free um, demeanor. So we've, we've talked about Darwin. Now we're kind of having a big um, change of scene. We're, we're heading to London, 1930s. Um, the male homosexual subculture of secret nightclubs and drag balls. Uh, anyone who doesn't know what a drag ball is, this is a party where men dress in drag. In early December 1932, police raided a house in Holland Park Avenue to discover a drag ball in full swing. Albert A. was powdered and rouged and bewigged. Joseph C. had on a low-cut evening dress and carried a handbag. As the police swarmed, lipsticks were hastily dropped, the men rubbed the powder from their cheeks, and the party's host, known to his friends as Lady Austin, turned to Inspector Francis, who was leading the raid. He pointed to another partygoer and asked if that man had in fact been an undercover police officer, and the inspector admitted that he had. Fancy that, Lady Austin says, perfectly in control his voice poised dangerously between irony and sincerity. Fancy that, he is too nice. I could love him and rub his jimmy for hours. <laughs> this account comes from the Metropolitan Police Archives and appears in the brilliant work of the historian Matt Holbrook and his book Queer London. The book charts a flourishing subculture in London at this time and, and also looks at police attempts to control it to the extent of even going undercover in drag to parties. But I want to return to Lady Austin's retort, he is too nice. When I read this, I found this actually incredibly moving. Here was a man about to be arrested, he was going to be charged, he was humiliated, his name would have been in the papers. And yet with all of that looming, he manages to keep his poise and with that extreme self-control, deliver this kind of dangerously confusing reply. Is it ironic? Is he being serious? Is he mocking? Does he really mean it? And in so doing, he kind of breaks the emotional rules of this encounter. The expectation, of course, is that he'll be frightened and ashamed. But instead, defiantly, he makes himself impossible to read. Susan Sontag has written about camp, or wrote about camp, that, it was a, that it's a sensibility and an aesthetic. She talks about travesties and theatricality and stylistic playfulness and the evasion of any strong feeling. But in the context of homosexual culture in London in the 1930s, camp was a very powerful weapon. This was a world which may have been vibrant and more visible than we usually think it is, but it was also replete with dangers, where a jokey catcall could turn violent. And in this context, insult rituals became a really important part of self-defense. As Holbrook writes, this kind of camp response was so effective because it was so unintelligible. It sort of baffled a potential aggressor. It made them back down. So there's an example of a kind of unreadable emotion, which is an extreme emotion. But what of the opposite extreme, of the person who is not showing any extreme or confusing display of emotion, but appears to not be showing any emotion at all? The flatness, I think, becomes as baffling and confusing as any camp insults flung by drag queens to the police. And I want to argue that it creates a different, but just as powerful form of resistance. I'll change the scene again, and this time we're going um, to the law offices of, an, of, of a New York lawyer. This is depicted in Melville's famous story, uh, Bartleby the Scrivener. This is a, a silent and pale and mechanical clerk of a, of a Wall Street lawyer, and uh, the lawyer is the one who narrates the story. Melville calls um, Bartleby's behavior passive resistance. 
So when the narrator asks Bartleby to perform a simple task, he find himself, uh, a simple task, he finds himself astonished by the man's reply, I would prefer not to. He tries again, but the answer's the same, I would prefer not to. The narrator says, had there been the least un at the least, the least uneasiness, anger, impatience or impertinence in his manner, I should have violently dismissed him from the premises. But instead, there is no emotion in Bartleby, nothing that he can latch onto, only a sort of impassivity that feels like, quote, a strange willfulness. In, in the story, um, this kind of emotional flatness gets characterized as, as pathological. Bartleby's withdrawal is, is ultimately framed as madness. I think he is a little deranged, says the narrator. To 19th century readers, Bartleby's behavior might have been recognized as a case of abulia, a type of mental illness characterized by a, a complete loss of will, a loss of interest in the world. Bartleby refuses to leave the offices, and eventually the police are called, and he is arrested for vagrancy and taken to the tombs where he, refu where he refuses to eat. I would prefer not to. Eventually, he's found dead, huddled at the foot of a wall. Um, Abulia was not the only way in which 19th century observers framed this apparent emotional withdrawal or, or flatness. As a scholar, Zain Yao, who works at the intersection of critical race studies and the history of emotions, has shown, um, accusations of being unfeeling adhered to many non-white people at this time, and she was particularly focusing on the cliché of the inscrutable oriental. So this cliché circulates very widely in late 19th century culture. It still circulates today. Um, whether these are images of cheating gamblers or enigmatic prostitutes or the claim that was made by 19th century ethnographers that Chinese people were sort of naturally more taciturn. Um, these are complicated accusations because they result in, in, on the one hand, accusations of insincerity and on the other, of, of sort of hard-heartedness. However, as, Zin, uh, as Zain Yao argues, um, one of the ways we can read these disaffected, emotionally illegible figures is to recognize the necessity um, uh, for that illegibility, to, to see it, in fact, as a strategy, a way of surviving in a world which is all too ready to belittle or project onto them. She cites Audrey Lord's letter to Mary Daly, which was written in 1979, in which Lord talks about the necessity of withdrawing from the emotional demands of others, and particularly from withdrawing from white women's guilt and white women's projections. She writes, I had decided never again to speak to white women about racism. I felt it was wasted energy because of destructive guilt and defensiveness, and because whatever I had to say might be better said by a white woman to another at far less emotional cost to the speaker. I'm very interested in this phrase, this at far less emotional cost, and I wonder whether precisely this survival tactic of active emotional refusal, with Audre Lorde so, which Audre Lorde so brilliantly articulates in relation to the power dynamics of racism and feminism, may be at work much more broadly in all kinds of situations where the cost of emotional transparency, the cost of, of saying what you feel, might be too high and might land unfairly on one particular person, on one speaker. So I'm going to um, finish in a moment, but um, before I do, I want to quickly speak about a story that went viral, a New York story that went viral last year. It was written by someone who at the time was, was fairly unknown, um, Kristen Rupinian, she's now very well known, um, and it's called Cat Person. Uh, the story is about a young woman uh, a college student called Margot, who meets a man, Robert, who's a lot older than her. We already realize that Margot is a person who has um, a sort of rather disaffected, ambivalent mood about her. She, she sees that Robert is someone that she might have a crush on, but it's probably an imaginary crush, she says, something she can sort of drum up if she was, say, bored in the lecture. So we get this kind of sense of a world which is of a woman who's at home with imaginary crushes, crushes rather than sort of biting passion of real crushes. Uh, they, their, their relationship unfolds by text message, lots of deadpan jokes. They don't really know anything about one another particularly. And then their flirtation evolves into a date. 
Um, during the date, we, we discover that Margot senses that Robert is someone who is very easily offended uh, and, and potentially someone who can get into a temper and be quite retaliatory. And again and again, I think we, 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 we learn that Robert is quite physically imposing. He's quite big. They go back to Robert's house at Margot's instigation, and they're at the, on the verge of having sex when Margot realizes she does not want to continue. She suddenly is disgusted by Robert, and the whole thing just feels awful. But, the, but I quote, the thought of what it would take to stop what she had set in motion was overwhelming. It would require an amount of tact and gentleness that she felt was impossible to summon. So after the sex is over, she thinks to herself with bright irony, this is the worst life decision I've ever made. <laughs> and she marveled at herself at the mystery of this person who had just done this bizarre and inexplicable thing. So Margot leaves, and she does not see Robert again. Um, she knows that ghosting him would be cruel. She knows that not replying to his text messages would be cruel. But she also is caught in the kind of exhaustion of trying to compose the absolutely perfect text to dump him. And, and, and her friend... Uh, who she shares the dorm room with, eventually just snatches her phone on and says, you know, stop texting me. And then he shows up at her student bar, and then she hides, and then he texts her again, and she doesn't reply. So on the one hand, this, this behavior of Margot's is, is certainly immature and hurtful. I'm sure we can all agree on that. Uh, and part of, the, part of the reason why this story went viral was, was a kind of a sort of shock, really, at how this character was behaving. Surely the emotionally intelligent response, of course, would be to, to, to face Robert and have a clear conversation with him, to tell him about her feelings. But on the other hand, Margot seems to intuit some risk in telling Robert how she feels, even the polite version. Just as she finds the thought of summoning up enough tact to stop the sex so overwhelming that she just goes through with it. So the possibility of finding a tactful way to dump him is just too hard. What Rupinian is, is pointing to, I think, is this very poisonous cocktail of having to manage this man's feelings and doing this very effortful emotional work, but also to recognize the kind of level of risk that, that she has to take on to be emotionally intelligent, to be transparent with her feelings. As I said, we're repeatedly told that Robert is physically imposing, that he's easily hurt, and I think these two things together scare her about him. When we talk about emotional intelligence and the assumption that emotional legibility is of uncomplicated value for us all, we forget to recognize the way that the cost of revealing emotions is sometimes greater for some people than it is for others. And as it turns out, Margot's intuition is right. The story ends with a string of texts which are sent by Robert, ending finally with a single word, whore. So, I will wrap up now. In this lecture, I've hoped to carve out a space for reflecting on a series of emotional enigmas. And I hope that you might take away from this lecture two ideas about the value of being and feeling enigmatic in a world which demands emotional transparency and legibility. The first point is that Though we know a great deal about emotions, about their physiology, about their cultures, they re remain extremely complex and particular phenomenon, varying so much from place to place and time to time. And I hope, therefore, that I've persuaded you, if you weren't persuaded already, to treat with a healthy dose of skepticism any claim that an app or a machine might be able to accurately detect them. And the second point I hope you come away with is that though we live in a culture which increasingly prizes emotional intelligence, and even suggests that it is a biological advantage in the form of empathy, the demand that we make our emotions legible to others is not experienced similarly by all people in all circumstances. There are moments, encounters, and situations, many more than I've touched on here, where being illegible, whether confusing or whether withdrawn, uh, that where being illegible may be a radical form of self-protection and a peculiar but effective form of defiance. Thank you.
So thank you, Tiffany, for such fascinating insights. Now, in these stormy days here in Cambridge, despite fear or flight from coronavirus or essay deadlines or anxiety about the future of various types, Cambridge is just about to put on its uh, glorious spring show of flowers. And emotions still run sweet on, on Valentine's Day. I hope, though, that we are not in danger of dying from nostalgia, nor of boredom. But one thing I can't help wondering is whether he studied people on trains. Charles Darwin was ever told, stop looking at me, desist, sir, <laughs> or something much worse. But I guess we don't know. <laughs> so... Next week, we move on. Uh, our lecturer will be Professor Eric Coquel, Coquel from the University of British Columbia in Canada, and he'll be speaking on the enigmatic pre-modern book. But finally, before we go, Tiffany Watsmith, thank you very much indeed for coming to speak to us this evening.